All right, I'm going to invite my friend uh, Ruben up. If we want to give him a rowdy welcome, that would be great. He's going to read scripture for us. Uh, If you haven't met Ruben, uh, he works for Henry Carlson Construction, and he takes gardening very seriously. So I'm very impressed with what he's created at his house. So if you're into gardening, if you have construction questions, you can talk to Ruben. All right, awesome. Thanks so much, man. Good morning. Let's see, our reading is from Matthew 26, 31 through 35. And Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ruben. Okay, so a couple of years ago, I had a kindergartner, and the school had a special day in kindergarten. They said, hey, you can come to gym class if you want. So I'm like, oh, yes. This is my moment. I've made for this moment. So I go to gym class, and that particular day, if you're in kindergarten, one of the standards for gym class, I'm going to show you what you have to do. You have to be able to balance on one leg for an extended amount of time. Okay, so we kind of all get into a circle. It's hilarious because the gym teacher is a classmate of mine from high school, and so I know her in a totally different context, so that's the whole other story for another day. Incredible. And so we're all in a circle, and you know, I'm like, oh yeah, this is going to be easy. This is no problem. I'm like sizing up, you know, like Sophie over here. I'm like, I can totally beat her, um, right? This is like kind of the moment, and so we get in a circle, and you guys, it is harder then you would think that it is. Like the first five seconds is not a problem, first 10 seconds, but like after 30, after 45, after a minute, like their bodies are just a lot shorter and they have a lot of core strength. I don't know if you've noticed in little kids. They have like a real strong core. And so we're kind of all in the circle and ever, and, and I'm doing it and I'm starting to hurt just a little bit. And they're just like, they're not paying attention. Right? Their eyeballs are kind of all over the place. And I'm really locked in. And I'm like, I am not going to let that guy go down before. Right? I'm, I'm not going down before him. And it's interesting, like in the scripture today, of how we step into those moments in our lives. That, like, even if this is going to be true for somebody else, it's not going to be true for me. Like, even if somebody's going to walk away from Jesus, if somebody's not going to be faithful, that's not going to be my story. Like, even if everybody else falls away, Peter says to Jesus, not me. Certainly not me. And even if I have to die, even if I have to die for you, I'm not going to walk away. And yet Jesus says, hey, (laughs) all of you are going to fall away. So don't talk to me about how perseverant you think you are. Don't talk to me about your ability to beat everybody else in the circle. That's not really what any of this is about. What this is about is you and your heart and your vision for my kingdom. And we're in this series looking at the life of Peter, not because we want to put him on a pedestal and not because we want to put him on trial, but because the life of Peter is a gift to us because Peter lives out the truth of what it means to be a person, of what it means to be a human being, what it is to wrestle, what it is to struggle, what it is to doubt, and what it is at times to get it right. And Peter really kind of presents in the scripture what people in literature call like a foil to Jesus. You know, a character that highlights what is true of another character. So we have a couple of famous foils I want to talk with you about. So first, I want to talk to you about Woody and Buzz. Are they, they kind of present like it's a foil for each other, right? So we understand who Woody is in light of who Buzz is, and so we can talk about that. We can also uh, talk about another famous foil. Oh, no, I'm going the wrong way, Bill. 
Thank you. Mater and Lightning McQueen, right? So we kind of understand, like, Lightning McQueen is this character, right? And he struggles to kind of stay focused, to stay faithful. And Mater is this slow and steady faithful. He's like a bulwark in the whole story. Okay, and then we've got another one, I'm pretty confident. So we've got Harry Potter and Draco Malfoy in the kind of Potter series. Or they, they kind of help us understand each of those characters. And then I did one, if you are from a little bit of a different generation, Lieutenant Dan and Forrest Gump. So I'm not allowed to watch that movie as a teenager. Don't tell my mom. Hope she doesn't watch this later. So they, they kind of present that for one another. And, and so we don't need to understand today that Jesus and his disciples, you know, from the last conversation we had, uh, they were up here in Caesarea Philippi, where that big golden star is up by Syria. And today they have traveled like 125 miles through the Kidron Valley into Jerusalem. And that's where they are. They're having this conversation at the very end of the life of Jesus. We have this incredible moment Jesus is gathered with his disciples uh, around a table, and it's not that they were sitting in chairs. They would have been kind of like on one arm, and there's a little short table. They're literally gathered around. They're all sharing food. There's really no plates. Everybody kind of just like digs in, and they're eating together, and Jesus is talking to them about his kingdom, about what's going to happen. And verse 31, Jesus says to the disciples, you will all fall away. Like you all are going to reject me. You all are going to turn away towards something else. And it's really interesting that Jesus calls people toward him who he knows will reject him. Like he knows that there's going to be a moment in calling them to follow him. He knows there's going to be a day, a moment, a time, a season. When it's not that they're going to drop their nets and follow him, they're going to turn away from him. And so what's true, Jesus is saying, like, hey, you're going to grow tired, and you're going to fall away. Like, you're going to grow bitter, you're going to grow angry, and you're going to fall away. You're going to get hurt, and you're going to fall away. You're going to get overwhelmed. You're going to feel overwhelmed. And what? You're going to fall away. You know, Matthew, though, doesn't tell us the reason. Like in this moment, Jesus isn't explaining why the disciples are going to fall away, but Luke does. So we'll read a little bit of Luke today. So Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brother. So like, what does the evil one want to do? What does Satan want to do? He wants to get into your life. He wants to challenge you. He wants to destroy stuff. He wants to pull you away from the life and the truth and the hope and the blessing of the way of the kingdom. That's what he wants to do. And he says, hey, I've prayed for you, Simon that your faith may not fail. And so my question is like, that's the plan? That like Satan's going to want to try to get into our life, going to come after us, wants to destroy stuff, wants to mess with things. And the plan, Jesus says like, hey, don't worry, I'm praying for you. You know, when I was a youth pastor, sometimes I would be really surprised when we'd go on a trip what like kids would bring them like that's what you packed we're gone for like eight days i'm counting three t-shirts and worse two pairs of socks that is not going to do and if i'm honest like this is a moment in the life of a disciple where jesus says like this is what's going to happen satan's going to sift you going to challenge you going to get into your life so don't worry. Like I've prayed about it. Like all those times when I walked away and got off by myself and 
early in the morning or late at night to pray, one of the things I was praying about was this moment. I was praying for you about this time. When Satan's wanting to get his claws in there, get his voice in there, get his plan in there, and move things around and sift you. Don't worry, Peter. And I don't know, like, Peter has to be thinking, because I sure would be like, okay, if that's Satan's plan, like, why don't you stop him? Why don't you thwart him? Why don't you shut him down? Why don't you make sure that he doesn't get to do what he wants to do? Or why don't you like send a bunch of angels? You got a bunch of angels up there. Like send a bunch of angels to protect me and to get me out of this. I don't know, Peter might be thinking like, hey, how about Egypt? Remember Egypt? Remember all those plagues? Remember like all the frogs? How disgusting was that? Could we like do that again? Would that keep Satan away from me? Like, how about Jericho? When, like, the nation of Israel, they're marching around the city. And, you know, we all know the like, nursery rhyme song, and the walls came tumbling down, right? Or the Veggie Tale version, it's a bunch of peas walking around the city of Jericho, and they're throwing slushies out. That's another thing for another day, but the whole thing comes tumbling down. How about Egypt? How about Jericho? How about like David and Goliath, like this little boy, and he's in the valley of Allah, and he's fighting against this huge giant. And God shows up, and he works in and through the natural order to bring Goliath down. Like, if you're Peter, aren't you thinking about these kinds of stories? Like the fiery furnace. When Nebuchadnezzar throws these young Hebrew boys into a campfire because they will not bow down, because they will not worship him, or like the lion's den, this boy Daniel, 14 years old-ish, eighth grade, gets thrown into a pit with a bunch of lions. He's able to trust God in that moment. And he's not torn to pieces. What happens is the kingdom that is against God, it's interesting, gets torn apart. But Israel is preserved. Like if you're Peter, and if what Jesus is telling you is like, hey, this is what's going to happen. Satan wants to sift you and get into your life and destroy stuff. But don't worry. Pray for you. Like, aren't you thinking, like, what about all of those mighty acts of God, those movements of God? I pray that your faith will not fail. And so I just, like, have to ask today, does that sound comforting to you? Or does that sound complicated? I've prayed for you that you will not fall away. And it sounds to me that there's a potential for like my faith to crack, like the windshield has cracked from all of the extra rocks off the semis on our way down 29. It sounds like there's a potential in this moment for the faith that I carry and I have to crack. And I'll be honest, like this moment feels a little bit like, like I'm out for a run and it starts to rain. And not rain just a little bit, but it's like raining hard. I mean, it starts to hail a little bit, and I'm running, I'm doing my best. And I'm looking for a way out of this deal, and here comes Caleb in his minivan. Praise the Lord. His minivan has cool wheels, though, so it's like way cooler than a normal minivan. And he like pulls the window down just a little bit, and he's like, hey, bro, hope you like make it home okay. No, 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 you are the way for me to make it home. You in the warm, cool wheel minivan with all the camera gear in the back. And I just think when we come to the scriptures, we need to be honest. And if we won't be honest, then we miss opportunities for connection with God. Because if I'm Peter... I'm not satisfied in my flesh that he's praying for me. 
because I want to get out of what I'm in. I'm not okay with it. I want to find a place of rest and blessing and life. But my desire for my life is that things will just kind of come together in my way, in my time. That's like kind of my desire, my will, my hope for my life. But that's not God's will and God's desire for my life. What's his will? What, his will and his desire, his hope for my life is what? That I look like his son. That my life reflects the, the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus. And part of what that is going to mean for me, what part of what that is going to mean for you and for us, is that we will walk through suffering. Because notice the mighty acts of God, Egypt, fiery furnace, lion's den, Jericho, valley of Allah. Notice the mighty acts of God. When do they come? When it's sunshine and double rainbows and two for one at Qdoba Day. No, they come in the moment of pain and suffering and anguish and confusion and doubt and anger. That's when they come. And so Jesus can look at Peter in the eye and say, Satan has come to sift you, but I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail. So part of what it will mean is that we will walk through suffering. In Philippians chapter 1, Paul talks about this. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. And so, you know, how, how do you avoid falling away? You know, Peter doesn't want to do that. Disciples don't want to do that. They all do. We find out in Matthew 26 later, if we keep reading all the way to 56, we find that, but this all has taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled, and then all the disciples deserted, and they fled, all of them. James and Andrew and Peter, Bartholomew, Levi, Levi happens to be Matthew. So when he's writing all the disciples deserted and fled, what is he writing? I did it too. It wasn't just Peter. All of us. We deserted and we fled. So how do you avoid falling away? I think one thing for us to grab a hold of this morning is just this idea of integrating the grace of God into your life. Not just to know about the grace of God. Not to just hear about the grace of God. But the work for some of us is to integrate the grace of God into our life. The way we integrate a new t-shirt into our wardrobe doesn't really do a lot of good to have something new that's not integrated, that's not received, that we haven't wrapped our arms around. It's receiving deep into your heart the truth that you can't out sin God's grace, that my rebellion's not stronger than his love. Like there's proof of that on every page. Like my propensity to turn away from him and to rebel is not stronger than the love that he has for me. And then we get to verse 35 of Matthew 26. But then Peter declares, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the disciples said the same. So Peter comes to love God more than his own life. We know that because he's killed. He's crucified. Church historians tell us upside down. He didn't want to be crucified in the same manner that his Lord was. But how's he feeling on that day? This is something that Peter grows into. Peter has to integrate, has to practice, has to step into the grace of God. And he comes to love God more than his own life. He comes to understand that God is the gospel. Like what you get in the gospel is not God's stuff, but you get him. 
He's not after the stuff that God can give him, but after his heart himself. Psalm 42, as the deer pants for water, so my soul pants for the living God. And so the question out of this text for me and for us today is, you know, what's true of us? Like, are we desiring him or are we desiring his stuff? That God is the gospel. That he is the good news. The life that we get to have in him is the good news. And so last question I have today. Like, why do all of the Gospels have this story? Matthew has this story. Mark has this story. Luke has this story. And John has this story. Why? Because not everything that happens in the Scriptures is retold by all of the Gospel writers. So why does this show up again and again and again in the Scriptures? And I'm not going to tell you I have an answer today, but I have a hunch. My hunch is it shows up in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John because Peter told it again and again and again and again and again. He was not afraid to tell the truth about his moment of brokenness and frailty. That he actually found that as he talked about this with people, it actually gave courage. It actually gave hope. It actually was able to sow faithfulness into people's lives. And I think that what Peter comes to understand is that two of the greatest gifts of God are repentance and forgiveness. The two of the gifts that God gives us as his people is the opportunity, the moment, to turn away from choices that we have made, from ways of thinking that have dominated our life, and to seek forgiveness. But there are things that get in the way of us receiving those gifts and living out those gifts. I think sometimes we tend to think of repentance and forgiveness like we think of a fire extinguisher. I know many of you are waiting for me to get to this. We got to it. Because when you purchase a fire extinguisher, you are not planning, you are not hoping to use it soon. You're not buying it on Friday, really hoping by like Tuesday morning at 10, I hope I can like throw this thing open. I'm not going to spray anybody. Nobody get nervous. It was last tested in 1974. This is from the fire department. They're getting rid of it. So I'd ask if I could just borrow it. So it would be very dangerous for me to, so please don't touch this. But I wonder if in the American church, we kind of think of repentance and forgiveness like, like they're gifts of God. We're just not planning to use them. And we're not going to have moments when we're actually going to need to repent and turn away. And moments where we're not actually going to need to be forgiven. And I think in this moment, Jesus is saying, like, through the Spirit in this moment, like, no, these are gifts. And you should use them. Don't neglect them. But we should live a life of repentance and a life of forgiveness, both when we step into a moment when we do something wrong, we make a wrong choice, and when somebody else, we have to leave room for other people to repent and to ask us for us to forgive them. This is what I believe Peter comes to understand at the end of his life. I invite the band up as we close today. So what would Peter say to us today? Like if Peter could sit here with us knee to knee, eyeball to eyeball, like what's his message? Like what would he say? Because this is not like an awesome moment. Like he's going to walk out of that last supper and by 2.30 in the morning, from the, that supper ending to 2.30 in the morning, by the third watch of the night, he's going to deny Jesus three times. 
He's going to deny knowing him. He's going to deny walking with him. He's going to deny a relationship with him three times. Like first watch of the night is like 1230. Some of you go to bed at the, during the first watch of the night if you're under 35. And then the second watch of the night is like 130. Third watch of the night is 235. In that amount of time, he's going to deny him three times. So what would Peter say to us today? I think two things he would say. First, I think he would say the hand that reached into Egypt the hand that reached against Pharaoh and said, no, you're actually going to let my people go. You're actually not going to treat them this way. Like the way and the will that I have for them is more powerful than the way and the will that you have for them. I think Peter would say the hand that reached into Egypt and the hand that reached into the fiery furnace and saved those young men from death and the hand that reached into the lion's den that that hand was open to me I think this is Peter's message to the world in the first century about the way of Jesus that Egypt thing, that hand yeah, that was open to me The hand that reached into the furnace, yes, that hand was open to me, yes. The the hand that saved those boys from the mouth of the lion, that hand was open to me. Even in my worst moment, even in my moment of failure, where I felt the lowest. That's number one. If you're taking notes, you're really annoyed with me right now. The second thing I believe that Peter would say is that the heart that beat for the stubborn Israelites. Around and around and around and around in that wilderness. The heart of God never stopped beating for them. That heart was never drained of love for them. Not when they refused to follow. Not when they got tired of following. The heart that beat for the stubborn Israelites, the the heart that beat for Zacchaeus, that short little guy up in the sycamore tree who had no idea that he could have a life that was sweeter and that was more rich and meaningful than the life that he currently had. But the heart that beat for those people, the Israelites and Zacchaeus and so many others, that heart was turned towards me. So if Peter had a message today, God's hand reached into those places and was open to me and that heart that beat for the Israelites and countless other people throughout the scriptures was turned towards me. So Peter's message is that you're not an outsider to God, so don't consider yourself one. When Jesus says, you'll all fall away, But stop thinking of your life solely in terms of what you will do. And stop thinking of your life in terms of what you have done and begin to think of your life in terms of what I will do. And to think of your life in terms of what I will make possible and what I have made possible for you. So will you hear Peter today? He's given us two gifts. God's given us the gift of repentance and the gift of forgiveness and the gift of himself. But that's the gospel. God is the gospel. Not that we come to him trying to get his stuff. We come to him and receive him. And that spirit brings life, brings power, brings grace and brings the strength when we need to pull this guy out and use it. So church, can we make an agreement together that we're just going to plan on using the gift of repentance and forgiveness. Let's just plan on using it. And when we use it, what we find is that the kingdom gets a little closer and feels less like getting out of here and going to heaven someday 
and feels a little bit more like, oh, like there's some, there's an aroma of heaven here. It's my desire for us and for this place, desire for myself. That I would more and more and more become a person who pulls out the gifts of forgiveness and repentance. And that will help me see and taste and get my arms around the kingdom. We pray. Lord God, we thank you today for Peter. And we thank you for this moment that he stood in. And that moment that reaches us on this morning. And God, we thank you for the gifts of the Spirit, for the gift that you have given us of repenting and making a decision to turn around. God, it takes courage to do that. It takes faith to do that. It takes bravery to do that. It takes trust to do that. And for the gift of forgiveness, of receiving a moment that someone has stepped in as not definitive of their life. Thank you for those gifts. Would you help us use them? Would you help us not put them on a shelf expecting to walk in performance or to walk in perfection or to walk in hiding but to live turn toward one another and to live turn toward you God we thank you for your hand and your heart that are open to us today in the name of Jesus we pray man would you stand we're going to sing one more song together